Welcome to the Leaders Agenda, a series dedicated to reimagining leadership within life sciences. My name is Tarja Huskonen, and I'm your host. The Leaders Agenda invites insights and perspectives from some of the very best leaders of our time. Wisdom that you too can build into your own Leaders Agenda. And today's guest is Steve Plant, who is the adjunct professor at Stanford and co-founder of the Gordian Knot Center for National Security Innovation. He has been described as the father of modern entrepreneurship. And of course, I am excited to be talking to him today about startups and innovation specific to life sciences, as well as biotech and medical devices. He has been credited with launching the Lean Startup Movement, which of course many of us have gotten uh, quite a bit of uh, advantage of in our innovation journeys. And he also uh, has developed several curriculums, uh, the most notably uh, NIH Innovation Corps, as well as Hacking for Defense and Diplomacy, which I'm going to have to ask you something more about because I'm intrigued to know what those curriculum are, curricula are. Thank you for joining me today, Steve. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful to have you here. There's so much that we could talk about, and we chose to talk today about startups and what makes startups actually succeed and, and sometimes not succeed. But before we get into that conversation, you have made uh, you have made a, kind of a career out of studying entrepreneurship and startups. What caught your attention and made you make that that big choice and and uh, investment in this particular topic? That's a great question. Actually, it's about my third career. Um, you know, my my first one was a stint in the military. My second one, though, was as a practitioner. I was in eight startups in 21 years in Silicon Valley and high tech companies. Um, and uh, everything from, you know, a junior employee all the way to a co-founder of a couple of startups. And it wasn't until I retired about a quarter century ago that I started thinking about the nature of innovation and entrepreneurship and got lucky enough to be invited to to teach at the business school in Berkeley and, and now in the engineering school and the national security part of Stanford. It turns out in the 20th century, investors, whether they were in life sciences or, or um, hardware and software, essentially thought of startups as smaller versions of large corporations. That is, everything a large corporation did, uh, startups were supposed to do. That is, in our case, we had, a, uh, we had an idea, we raised money, and then based on that plan, our job was to execute the plan and simply collect the money when customers bought, whether it was our medical device or our microprocessor or anything else. We assumed that actually what was in the plan was uh, a series of facts. When, in fact, the observation I've made, which practitioners kind of knew but never articulated, is all we had on day one is a series of untested hypotheses. Mm -hmm. And that's a big idea. That is, startups are not smaller versions of large companies. Large companies execute what are called known business models. And we'll talk about that later. But you know customers, you know regulatory issues, you know you know CPT codes. And, and the, if, you're, if you're a large company, you understand that. But if you're a startup, you have hypotheses maybe about reimbursement or, or uh, regulatory issues, but that's all they are on day one. And there was no formal methodology. That is, there were no formal tools to differentiate startups from large corporations. And so my work and then the work of others now started to build these, first of all, this framework about how to think about early stage entrants, whether they're startups or innovation inside of existing companies, and then build the tools that go with it. And that those tools became the Lean Startup and some programs offered by the NIH and NSF, et cetera, now in its second decade. So that's the long answer to your very short question. That's a great answer, actually. And and, and it's interesting when you think about, you mean, mentioned actually startups or, or innovation inside an existing company. A little bit later, I'd like to actually uh, maybe explore the latter also a little more because it feels that there's a lot that larger companies can also learn from startups and vice versa, I'm sure. But before that, um, I was looking at some... 2023 data on just how startups are doing, particularly in, in, in our industry. It looks as though we are still only about 10% success rate um, in terms of uh, biotech or medtech type of uh, startups. It hasn't really changed very much. Those are pretty good numbers. Well, so, so that means that 90% fail. So you say 
that's good in terms of it's a valid number. It's 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 actually a pretty good thing if 10% succeed. Well, if 100% succeed, then you're not innovating. You're simply executing. It's a big idea. In yeah. a large organization, you want to, in fact, launch products built on existing knowledge, uh, whether it's scientific knowledge or customer knowledge, that you could guarantee a level of certainty that what you put into the pipeline comes out. But that doesn't create innovation. That creates execution. And that distinction really needs to be clear is that if you're not failing in a portfolio of companies, you're not taking enough risk. And that, that is really hard for people who don't do innovation to get their head around. Innovation and execution are not the same. No, nope, they're not. Our risk profiles are, are different. More importantly, the people are different um, and the outcomes are different. That is the typically incremental innovation will give you at times, incremental revenue, or sometimes it could be a, a force multiplier, but creation of new things, new drugs, new devices, new business models are the ones that you want to experiment with. And that's why venture capital is actually called risk capital. It's not the same as getting a bank loan or, or getting more money in a large company for the next project. So people looking at the 90% failure and 10% success, you know, sometimes miss the point of, of the distinction between you know, innovation and execution. That makes a lot of sense. You said um, just now that the skills are different if we're thinking about really truly innovation versus execution. Can you say a little bit more about that skill set? What is the most important skill set as we as we focus specifically on startups and innovation? Well, if we had a couple of hours, we could spend an entire session on this. But but let me just remind you, and and, and again, it's not that People inside of large companies don't innovate and have great skills. It's just that people um, who do startups or new ventures are crazy people. Um, that is, and, and I mean that in a very nice and benign term, but there are people who see over the horizon. They hear things that other people don't. They see things that other people don't. The founders of new ventures are closer to artists than any other profession. That is, if you think about an artist, uh, they have a passion for creation. And by the way, most of their art fails. Not everything is, you know, uh, the Mona Lisa or, or the Pieta. But in fact, because they have this urge to create um, or to invent, um, they constantly do it. So number one, it's a passion for creation and curiosity and exploration. And they're usually agile, meaning they're, uh, they have the ability to kind of take new data in and, and, um, and essentially run the scientific method by hypothesis, experimentation, data, modify, etc. And then they're resilient. If you remember my analogy of artists that mostly fail, well, they don't shoot themselves every time someone doesn't like a painting. They get depressed for a week and drink a lot and then go off and... And start again. Exactly, exactly. And typically, a successful venture as a company, as a corporate entity, um, a for-profit entity, has a team of a combination of founders, typically mm -hmm. a technical founder, uh, you know, a, a person who focuses on the science and technology and often, a, you know, a person focusing on the outside, on the business uh, side. Sometimes that's one person, you know, who has both skill sets. And we see that a lot more in life sciences, in fact, than we do in hardware and software. Someone who ran a lab and, and scaled his lab it actually is capable of both fundraising and uh, and the science, but it really uh, requires multiple skills. What was your question? Well, actually, the, you, you totally are answering it because I think, uh, you know, it wasn't the technical side that I was really looking for. It was more sort of what what is the makeup or of that person who fits into that startup space because it's also a different mindset. It's a different mindset from that execution space, I think. And and you and you bringing up the whole idea of the curiosity and and really wanting to create something. I think I mean I think there's a passion for creation. And back to your observation about the innovation in large organizations, you know this is what messes up large organizations is thinking that you could run innovation and execution inside of the same organizational design. That is, you could have them in the same company, but they can't be in the same organization. You would separate that innovation arm in a large organization such that it can actually operate independently. It has its own staff. It's not dependent on all of the different constraints that we have more on the execution mode. Yes, but, and the but is important. It's not that the executors aren't innovative. They're being innovative along the existing products. They could be doing product line extensions or or you know, new markets, et cetera, innovation does occur in existing product lines or existing sure. drugs or whatever. 
so let me be clear. It's not like one half isn't innovating, but what I'm talking about is disruptive innovation, you know, blue sky and, and, and innovation for things that don't already exist. Boy, that, and that's not just research. That's research to, uh, that's focused on commercialization or trans, uh, translation. That needs to be 100% outside of the you know, typical P&L budget schedule, quarterly, whatever. And, and by the way, it's why most now large pharma companies and others buy these companies rather than figure out how to build the organization inside that allows them to what I call chew gum and walk. Because ultimately, execution pays your salary, but innovation pays your pension. Um, and if you don't have both inside of a large organization, you know, you might make the next couple of quarters, but... But then your portfolio is going to start drying out and it's certainly not going to be exciting, right? And then you're going to end up paying and competing for uh, stuff on the outside, which yeah. might be, a, you know, a viable business model for, for companies that haven't built that that culture and pipeline inside. And we certainly see that more and more. We, we, see, right. we see large companies acquiring... Uh, you know, acquiring these startups, that is always an interesting thing for me to be looking at because I think sometimes they acquire the startup, and, but then they integrate that so much and so closely into everything that they already have internally that sometimes they lose some of that edge that they, they were looking for when they went to acquire that or new organization. But let's go back to the startup world because I really, really want to understand more about what makes startups work well and what the process of starting up a business and specifically, you know, your own background and and also a lot of the work that you've done has been on the technical side and in biotech or or our medical devices, life sciences. Obviously, it's the work of science. It's a work of engineering many, and, and bringing in a lot of different um, domains together. Is there a... Um, could we sort of think about the startup process in phases and what would be the phases of a startup organization that they go through? Startups start from a variety of areas. And let's just take life sciences. They could start with a, a university principal investigator who comes up with something new in their lab. And, um, and that is, it's a technology or a, a patentable insight or whatever. It could come from business people who realize that, gee, there's some regulatory changes and we could take advantage of those and create a mm -hmm. new... Um, some healthcare and and COVID and remote work allowed us to create you know um, uh, therapies online and get reimbursed from that or changes in reimbursement yeah. rules etc. So the starting point could be from um, multiple ideas, but the next step is um, figuring out and this is where um, a lot of startups, particularly in life science, fail is confusing the invention with the business. It's a big idea. You know, yeah. just because I've figured out a new CRISPR model or, you know, a new device that um, eludes drugs or implantable or whatever, it doesn't mean I have a successful company. It means I might have an interesting way to start. Um, but unless you understand um, how you raise money, why will people use it? Or most importantly, if you're going to raise money, why, in fact, a dollar in will return an obscene amount of money to your investors and your yep. company, you kind of miss the business model part. And that's the part that this i -Corps program actually taught principal investigators in both the National Science Foundation and the NIH, is not how to do their invention, but how to do their commercialization, how to actually think about what are the components of a successful company and some of the subtleties of, gee, in medical devices, do you get acquired? And therefore, rather than going public or and scaling and therapeutics, you know, what kind of licensing deals are you doing and when? And how do you go public on just based on some phase two or phase three indications or even earlier because it's a field? So thinking about things that folks in the lab never think about at all because your focus was on the science and invention, but recognizing that's not the same as commercializing um, uh, that invention. Does that make sense? Uh, it's just kind of a high... Yes, it does. And it's interesting because as, as a consultant to, to um, life sciences... I do get called sometimes with with innovators who I really consider the innovators. They are the they are the they are the people with the big ideas. They have from their perspective they can think of oh my gosh you know if we only go with this let's just say this technology or this kind of a platform, this can address this this and this and this and they have all kinds of thoughts about how it's going to change the world. And when I say well so how far have you you know 
what are you sort of thinking in terms of your discernment on this one? There's been really no think, thought also about needing to sort of validate those ideas maybe with the rest of the world. So tell me more about this m moving from that just I've invented something amazing, more into the business world, also more into validating these things with the real world and real customers. What's what? What should we do? So what we did is actually taught it as a class, and that became the NIH uh, I Core program, still taught in a couple of divisions. It basically, I mean, my thinking for how to educate principal investigators, and that's where it needed to start, was if you're going to be the technical founder and eventually either end up as the head of the scientific advisory board or chairman or something, you need to get some hands on for a couple of weeks of yourself trying to understand this commercialization stuff. And we start with something called the business model canvas. This is one of the key components of the lean startup method, which says it's a single piece of paper and it has nine boxes on it. Who are the stakeholders, the customers, the beneficiaries, the, you know, all, all the people involved? What is it that you're going to sell to them? And what's the value proposition? Is it a device? Is it a service? Is it something else? And then all the other boxes, which are kind of interesting is, you know, what are the key activities your company needs to be expert at? Well, you need to raise money. You need to have regulatory expertise. Mm -hmm. You need to have reimbursement expertise. And then besides that expertise, do you understand the regulatory process? Do you understand the reimbursement process? Is this a device? So you need a PMA or 510K or any of the new things? Or is it a therapeutics and, you know, phase one through three? And wait a minute, does this need a clinical trial? Well, do you understand what a CRO does and what the clinical endpoints are? If you're just in the lab, your head's going to explode on day one when you go, really? I need to know all this stuff? Yes. And not only do you need to know it, we're going to force you to get out of the lab and out of the classroom and personally talk to over 100 customers, regulators, and partners in seven weeks. This is part of your NIH program? Yeah, this is the NIH program. I so, love that. And That's so it's, great. Uh, it, it's the PI at what they call an entrepreneurial lead, which is their best grad student. Actually, in asterisk, my, my opinion, it's their best grad student. They don't want to go to academia. Um, and, and an industry mentor. And it's a, those team of three get out trying to understand not the science. Assume the science is going to work. Just, just humor us. Assume the science is going to go work. I want you to understand all the moving parts in seven weeks not by reading a lot, ton of stuff, but actually going out and meeting them, the folks in the FDA or meeting the folks in CMS or somewhere else that actually, you know, have the rules and regs. You could go read them, but it's a lot more interesting to meet them, meet consultants who spend their careers actually teaching people, etc. Sure. I want you to talk to all these folks and I want you to build, if possible, minimum viable products, which are Basically, what can get me the most learning at this point in time? Could it be a price list? Could it be a, you know, an example of a clinical trial, a, a plan for a trial? Could it be, oh, you're building a medical device? Can, is it a mock-up? Have you sat in an operating room with, you know, and watched surgeons use X or Y? Or, or gee, have you mocked up something else? And for if it was, uh, or certainly for digital health, uh, you know, where's the prototype of what this thing is going to look like? And does it pass, you know, HIPAA and all the other compliance things? Do you understand all those? We could teach this in an incredibly compressed amount of time. And all of a sudden, PIs who most of them never take a sabbatical and run the company, though some do. But let me tell you, it transforms their entire view of their lab for the next decade or two. When they are teaching students, they go, let me tell you when I had to go out and talk to customers. Let me tell you when. And so the goal of both the NSF and the NIH wasn't to turn these principal investigators into founders. It was actually to give them a ability to understand that translational piece of how you take things out of a lab and turn it into companies to reduce that infant mortality rate. Because a good chunk of that failure in that funnel of startups are simply that, you know, crossing the chasm part of the valley of death but between ideas. Typically, if you got an SBIR grant or something else, um, you you would kind of get stuck because you were still thinking you were doing science rather than business. And I was just going to say, and you said it before me, it's a transformation. It really is. I mean, this is an immersion. The goal is an experiential immersion for PIs who've probably never left the lab in the last decade or two. And it's an opt-in program, not a, you know, it's, there's no forced march here. But I'd say 95% of them who come out of these programs come out much, much smarter and much more 
with a much deeper understanding of this distinction of what you've been working on on the bench versus what you need to do if you're interested and only if you're interested in, in taking that out to the commercial space. Normally, there's an, a major impedance mismatch between those understandings and expectations. And this kind of like, you know, connects them in, in a way it doesn't make the PIs business experts. But instead of teaching them how to write five year forecast or trying to yes. make them into MBAs, it gets them immersed into the practicalities of what what does it take? And by the way, it makes them appreciate, you know, all those people that eventually you will hire. And it actually helps them differentiate between people who just blovate in an interview versus those who actually bring real skills into their new startup. What's the typical reaction? Of, of, of these folks who go through that, you know, as you, as you sort of watch them through the weeks that they, they, they are going through the program. It's been a while since I personally taught the class, but I remember teaching the first couple of them. And, and I remember on day one, the attitude is, I still remember one, uh, someone who says, well, I don't need to do this. I'm a PhD MD and like, I know all this stuff. And I went, well, so are the other 75 people in the room. So sit down and we'll see if you say that in the end of the class. And yeah. everybody has to do a final presentation, not a demo day, but a lessons learned day. And a oh, lessons what? learned day is here's what I thought on day one. Here was my journey of how I learned to how I got to where I am now. That's much more interesting than, you know, kind of a beauty contest of my slides. That learning process actually tells me and uh, told NSF and NIH, was this team capable of learning or were they just trying to use this as a as an incubator? And the answer is, I'd say 90 plus percent, you know, go, holy cow, <laughs> you know, we ended up nowhere. Where, and I remember the head of surgery of UCSF had this great device he wanted to build to, to solve hernias. And, and of course, you know, he'd been working on it for a couple of years and thought it was a no brainer. It was just going to take the class so he could get his other residents to, or, or uh, folks to, to take the class as well. And he ended up, his final presentation said, well, I understood this was a problem, but no one else thought it was a problem. This is going to be what I'm going to kill the product. And now I don't know if that was the right decision, but boy, did he get schooled. And this was not some, you know, somebody right out of med school. This is somebody who was running a department at a, at a major university. So a lot of the learning occurs and most of it is a shock to the system. It creates in the middle of this process, huge cognitive dissonance because mm. by, by definition, they're all smart. I mean, they're off the scale, of right? So being able to process things that um, that create, you know, conflicts in your head, that really takes a while, which is why it's not a one week program, it's 10. The way we frame it is the way that I think works best is, look, this is simply the scientific method. We're asking you to frame everything you thought on day one as a series of untested hypotheses. Oh, well, that's what we do. Great, so what are we gonna do outside the building? We're just not interviewing people, we're testing a hypothesis. We're testing a hypothesis about who are the payers and how we would be reimbursed. That's a hypothesis. We're testing a hypothesis about the regulatory regime. We're testing a hypothesis about the size and scale of clinical trials. We're testing hypotheses about whether this is fundable. All of a sudden, if you frame it like that, rather than, gee, here's my opinion as an instructor. No, 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 we're, we're letting you start with your opinions, but we're giving you a way to actually validate those yeah. And, and something that's a 500 year old method. So, in fact, this is why at first the National Science Foundation uh, adopted this class and methodology, because when I first taught it at Stanford, I got a call that said, we think you invented the scientific method for entrepreneurship. <laughs> OK, I, you know, I, that wasn't my goal. My goal was just to emulate my 20 some odd years of experience as a founder and, a, a, and running startups and building them and realizing that the way we had been teaching entrepreneurship in the 20th century was, you're ready for this, how to write a business plan. And to some degree, we still do that. I, it, there's still a lot of that going around. Well, if it is, I would uh, go to a different school. <laughs> yes. Because what we now know is no business plan survives first contact with customers. It's a big idea. Um, it's a great organizing principle for your hypotheses, but to execute the plan, assumes that your hypotheses are actually facts. But we really know that on day one, a startup is a faith-based organization, not a fact-based organization. And the goal of this process is to turn faith into facts as rapidly as possible. That is very interesting, actually. Turn faith into facts. So at which point does the innovator 
so they they might go through your program so they that 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 becomes fast a process for them but at which point does the innovator need to start really thinking about who else they need to bring into the fold and who would be the first people just based on all of your learnings and what you just said about this program if i only bring a few people at the beginning to work with me and i'm the innovator who would i be looking for I'm the technical person who had the great idea for the medical device. What you're really looking for is first less a person and more something called product market fit. You're looking for, not that I talk to a lot of people, but in fact, I have found a fit between what I think I'm building and customers. And the first question is, who's the customer? And the game I used to play with my students doing medical devices, for example, is, gee, grandma needs a new hip. Who's the customer? And the students go, well, that's pretty simple. It's grandma. I go, really? Grandma, you know, put in her own hip? Oh, no, I guess the customer is the surgeon. Oh, great. Can the surgeon put in any hip? Oh, no, I, I guess there is some regulatory process. Well, who's that? Well, it's the FDA. Great. What process is it? PMA, 510K, something else? Oh, okay. Well, great. Oh, by the way, um, now that we decided it's a surgeon and a, a has to be approved device, um, can the doctor put it in their office? Oh, no, there's a hospital. Great. Does the hospital have a stock of infinite number of hips? No, there's probably an approved list. Great. I, who approves the, the hips? Oh, I don't know. Well, who pays for the hips? Grandma with a credit card? Well, hopefully not. There, oh, there's an insurance. There's reimbursement. So if you go down through these 20, just this simple 20 questions, the, the real interesting question is who's the customer, right? Yeah. And what's the product market fit? And Absolutely. And in healthcare... There's product market fit in multiple areas. There's in the users, in the payers, in the in the government, et cetera. And you need to make sure that you've checked all those boxes, that you not only understand them, but you have a fit, a solution for each one of those stakeholders. To answer your question about when do you hire, it's when you actually are starting to get closer to, hey, I understand this and there might be a business here. Now I need to bring on some of those consultants so some of those regulatory people as consultants might need to be full-time people. Some of those business consultants might need to be salespeople. Oh, gee, I'm the PI and I was running the science side, but I hate the admin side. Maybe I want to be head of the SAB because maybe I just took a sabbatical to do this. Here's kind of a model for, for therapeutics and devices and diagnostics and digital health. Venture capitalists have different models of how to build the team and, and when the PI needs to step in or out, or isn't an extraordinary PI who actually should be running a company. Again, higher percentage of those in, in, the, uh, in life sciences and healthcare than probably any other domain. But the team building is kind of a known model set. Also, the liquidity events are kind of known model sets that depend on the external economic environment. It's a big idea. So if you have buddies, um, you know, men and women who have maybe built a successful company 10 years ago, I will tell you the rules are absolutely guaranteed to be different today. And so it's like asking what the weather is. Well, what was the weather last year is completely irrelevant of, to what the financial weather, the regulatory weather, weather the, the acquisition weather, et cetera. It, it doesn't mean that you know, we're no longer paying in dollars in the United States, but almost everything else you need to check in how are companies being grown, bought, sold, acquired, etc. Obviously, the financial side of it is is a big part of the conversation. And of course, I mean, in, in our industry, getting a product out the door is very expensive, e even in the early phases, starting starting to get there. And then once you get to the regulatory process, it gets even, even more significant. But right in that startup mode, you mentioned VCs. Can you explain a little bit more about how that relationship with VCs and scientific startups usually works. When does it start? What are the VCs looking for? And what should the what should the startup founder watch out for? Venture capital is kind of a financial asset class, which is a fancy word for a pile of money looking to make more money. It's a big idea. The difference is is they take more risk than your bank or other places by betting on a portfolio that is they're not just going to invest in your company they're going to invest in you know 10 or 20 or depending on the size of the money they have to invest in what's called their fund because the hit rate as you said is low meaning most things in their portfolio will not succeed and that's okay if they're good at figuring out well 
here are the most likely ways that the, these might succeed. And so number one is you should understand that their interest and yours are aligned to the extent that they want you to grow and get big to either get sold or go public or, or something else. But as much as they might be altruistic, they're in it to make a big pile of money, right? And, which, which might differ from your goals of curing cancer or solving disease problem X or Y. Uh, but you need to understand your investors are not your friends. They're your investors. They might become your friends, but their business is different than yours. That's a big idea. It took me seven startups to understand that. They have a business model of their own, which is different than yours. You yeah. are aligned for a while, but but the minute they get out, get, get out of alignment, their interests tend to win. It's not an evil business. It's actually a great business, and, and they do wonderful stuff. We wouldn't have the ecosystem we have, but, but founders sometimes get confused about why they're getting money. Number two is... On day one, I kind of teach even the principal investigators in some industries, if your goal, um, if, if your business model and the model of your industry is a acquisition that is eventually you're going to be bought, then part of your job as the CEO is to figure out who are your potential acquirers. At the same time, you're working on the technology and, and well, you know, figure out customers, the acquire, potential acquirers need to be on your list of, of potential stakeholders. And what that means in tactics is, do you understand who they are? Make me a list in the like the third or fourth board meeting of who are the, all the possible places we could be acquired to. Great. What's the names of their tech scouts? What do they read? What conferences do they go to? Are you keep doing those conferences? Most founders don't even think about that till years later. And for me, it's just a natural part of what you're going to do. Or if the other one is you're in the therapeutics. Gee, if you're going to be licensing... Who are the potential licensees? These days, and we talked about this just, just a moment ago, that there, the, some of the larger companies that have been a while out there, they're looking for, for this, and they've gone further now, where they have a whole arm that actually is an investing arm. Yes. So, so now, you know, corporates have corporate venture capital. And, and so one of, the, one of the things you might want to look for early on is, you know, who are the best investors that understand your industry? And for corporate partners, you know, who might you want to take money from, but you need to be careful because if you take one from one corporate, the odds of their competitors wanting to invest in you have gone, or acquire you have gone down. Not to, not to zero, but you've made it a lot harder. But you're really, on day one, if you haven't ever taken venture capital, my first rule is, besides the money, what value add can they help you to understand the business side of um, you know, the basic blockings and tackling of running a life science or healthcare company, but what's their network for customers and regulators and partners. And, and at first, while you're trying to get them excited about you, once they are, then you need to be interviewing them politely about what value yeah. added do they bring on all those business parts that they might understand, or what even technical advisors do, do they have in their kind of, um, stable of it, people they they hang with that might actually help you on to solve some of the technical problems great vcs bring all of that stuff in addition to money and and then you can kind of loop back to what i originally said but they're not doing it in like just for altruism they're doing it to enhance the the, the force multiplier that they could bring to a very profitable outcome. So if, if someone has a, a potential innovation that could yield itself for multiple different applications, different intended uses, indications for use, so they don't necessarily want to corner themselves immediately into just one. So the discernment process, on the other hand, so so I guess I'm going back to the scientific side a little bit for, for a second here, but tying it with what you talked about earlier, understanding your customers, understanding your users, and for that matter, understanding the patients and what, what are the big, sort of the big needs um, and value drivers for all of those constituents. The discernment process then from a scientific side, it has to be also there at some point to say, what do I focus on? Because I have to be able to have uh, at least a, a scientific proof of concept even before I have a clinical proof of concept. Is there, so just sort of any advice on in that process? Because I do know that discernment can be difficult. Sometimes we get excited about all the things that are possible and it's, it's difficult then to 
to to pick the few that we'll concentrate on to go deeper. So again, this is where venture capitalists could be useful or sometimes un- unhelpful, to, depending on their insight. But it should be part of the equation. I mean, sometimes these decisions are just made by a technical founder based on the technology without any, you know, bigger knowledge about, well, what would what would add increased value to the company, um, short term, medium term and long term? And sometimes, you know, it's good to ignore like that. It's like, well, that's not why I'm doing this. And you're creating something that investors have never even thought about. Or sometimes it's like, you mean if we just picked X, we could sell this thing tomorrow? Well, that's a that's at least data that should go into the conversation. I've been talking about venture capitalists and their value, and they tend to take, not 10, they will have seats on your board. And basically, if you're the CEO, their job is to hire and fire you, particularly if you were the founder. But one of the things I learned is um, when you start doing everything your board has said, you are no longer the founder. You've become an employee. Um, and what I mean by that is they didn't hire, they, they didn't fund you for you to execute their ideas. And there's a fine line. They funded you to have some insights and take this thing into a place that creates huge value for them. They're only visiting. They have great pattern recognition skills and they understand typically a broader space than you do. But you know more about where your product or service or technology could go than they do. Like I remember coming out of my first board meeting in a pretty advanced technology company and finding thinking about the advice I had just gotten. And if I would have executed all of them, they were all mutually exclusive. I mean, I I could not have done. And and they were all great pieces of, in fact, I I had confused myself thinking I was getting direction. But at the end, it's really just advice. And as a founder, you have to be prepared to be fired. I kind of think of running a startup in, in any industry as you have to have profound beliefs loosely held. You know, profound beliefs, meaning you have to believe we we could solve X or we want to go in this direction. And that's why people call a vision. Loosely held means, gee, you're running kind of evidence-based. You're trying to gather evidence-based data, et cetera, to, to whether your hypotheses are correct. Another source of input is your board, et cetera. And that might affect your profound beliefs. But if you don't have any profound beliefs, you're just going to be jerked around by either the last piece of data or someone with the loudest voice in the room or someone with the most money in the room. And that's what yeah. makes the role of a founder both interesting, difficult, and uh And for me, ultimately enjoyable. For you, you said ultimately enjoyable, not necessarily enjoyable for everyone. So if if I'm I'm really much more into the technology, which kind of comes back to, can the founder be the leader of the organization once the organization starts kind of formulating itself and it gets into more the business process? So it's a big idea. It it's and I'm now going to give you a business school answer, which is. It depends. My skill set was, you know, after like a thousand people or actually a couple hundred people, I found myself essentially being the head of HR rather than like doing the things I enjoyed. And so we hired the CEO of KPNG to run our company and we took it to a much bigger scale. Um, but the goal was to own the biggest chunk of stock while someone else was doing the what I thought the great parts I didn't know how to do or didn't care to do. So it really depends on what your goal is um, as a founder is your goal to, you know, because you can be chairman with controlling interest and whatever to make sure that it's still your company, or you could like mess that up on day one and give up controlling interest and, and not realize that till later until you're standing in the parking lot looking at the company you used to run. It really depends on what your what you believe your skill set is, what your skill set actually is, and what your board believes your skill set is. And what you also what will give you also that replenishment that you keep going, right? I mean that that's that's a big part of it. It's yes. easy to get sidetracked. So here's something interesting is that um, a large percentage of founders operate exceptionally well under chaos and uncertainty. And the reason why is a large percentage of those grew up in dysfunctional families when that was actually a survival skill. And they're the survivors of those families. Not everybody had the same brain chemistry. And the survivors grow up with skills to shut down everything except that which is essential for survival. That exactly the training um, skills necessary to run a startup in its early days. So if you keep that in mind, um, one of the interesting observations is founders who have that background, who are great in chaos and uncertainty, in fact, are so comfortable in it, 
end up throwing organizational hand grenades into their own organization to keep the chaos going because they're uncomfortable with repeatable execution process. That would make scale-up really difficult, right? Because at some point, as you start growing, you need to start putting uh, more process in place, standardize certain things, and that kind of works against that whole mindset. Yeah, so if you've seen founders do that, then you want to probably, you could probably bet on how they grew up because they're simply uncomfortable with, in fact, these repeatable processes. Sometimes some of these things require a therapist, not a board, but... um, and, and that's the time when boards get involved and you have the classic, the founders, the board stole my company when in fact the board was actually trying to preserve, you know, the value of the company before the founder self-destructs it. So the word scale up and scalability, the word scale up can mean a lot of different things depending on what a person's background is. But when we talk about startups and what scale up means for that, what does it mean? My definition of a startup is that a startup is a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. Well, if we kind of deconstruct them, temporary organization, that means the goal of a startup is not to be a startup. The goal of a startup is to be a large company. By the yeah. way, a lot of startups have not figured that out. A lot of startups are happy to, you know, I'm living on SIBRs, you know, some SBIR grants and government research grants, and I'm happy being a little researcher. Okay. But that's not really a startup. That's a small business or a hobby. Temporary organs designed to search. Well, the search part was get out of the building and look for this product market fit for each one of those stakeholders. For repeatable and scalable. Oh, that gets interesting. So that means for every input of a dollar in, I need N dollars out in either revenue or licensing or something or users or whatever the metrics are or value, you know, at least in perceived when I go through different phases of FDA trials, business model. So I I have a model of what my business is. So now uh, the startup is a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. And so a scale up is a startup that has found some of those key components, right? I now, I I don't even have to be cash flow positive, but I have a business model that was maybe, maybe it's a licensing model, or maybe it's something else that's going pretty well. And the value is going up with the worth of the company. You don't start with a fundamental definition, then you get all these arguments of, oh, it looks like this, or it's cash flow positive or whatever. No, is have we like found product market fit and are, do we have a scalable model? Because a scalable model allows you to hire scalable employees. In the beginning, a startup is in fact, people who are comfortable with chaos and uncertainty because you're running off of hypotheses that are changing almost on a daily basis as you're testing them. It's scalable when you validated those hypotheses. So now you could write product specs and marketing data sheets and whatever, and you could hire people who are comfortable in execution where there's no chaos or limited chaos. You said you've started seven, eight different? I was in, I was in eight startups. I think I, I would could rightly say I was a co-founder in three of them. Okay, all right. Your own biggest learnings out of those experiences. Listen, this whole lean startup model came out of my biggest failure, which was, uh, um, you know, I had, of all things, after, after I had a supercomputer company and microprocessor companies, I actually dabbled in the video game business. And it was like, don't ask me why I was there, but, you know, I was the, on the cover of something called Wired Magazine. And, and uh, um, I don't know if it's still around. And, and literally 90 days after we were on the cover, uh, I realized we were going to go out of business. I was the CEO and I had to call my mother and said, mom, I lost $35 million. And my mom was a immigrant and she, English was not her first language. And she had to think about what I said. And then she said, well, you lost $35 million. Where'd you put it? I said, no, I didn't, didn't misplace it. It's gone. And, you know, she started panicking. And the name, the country we came from is gone. You can't, there's nowhere to go. And we can't even change the name. It's already blank. And I, I was kind of amused. Uh, but, but I said, no, the people who gave me, um, gave me the money just gave me another $12 million to do my next startup. And I tell the story because what's great about being an entrepreneur in an innovation cluster, and that is in an area or a country where innovation is understood, is you get multiple shots at the goal, as long as it was an honest failure. And so for me, the, there were a couple of lessons out of that failure. One is um, the company failed because of hubris, which is a Greek word, which essentially is tragedy. It was like, gee, I had done a bunch of successful things prior and, and thought I could do no wrong. And therefore this one was going to be a no brainer. I was great at raising money and getting press. 
but we made terrible products. And so it didn't matter, you know, all about me. It mattered about the products and customers, and I had forgotten that. And so that was an important lesson. And the lean method, which I'd already been practicing components of it, all came together in the next startup. Out of the ashes actually came the customer development process and the lean methodology. And without that failure, we wouldn't have had the methodology we have today. We have, somebody else would have invented it. It didn't come out of thin air. It actually is the sum of best practices people were doing anyway, but with a language and a method and a tool set. But out of that failure, it really forced me to go back and think about what is it I knew, what didn't I know, what kind of mistakes I had made, et cetera. And, I, and you know, out of that eighth startup, I was able to retire when I was 45. Take the, those learnings and create this tool set. Did you say that the, the same people funded your next startup. Yeah. And that is the nature of, you know, does that happen often? Well, I, I, as I said, I, I think I went over it quickly in an innovation cluster. Failure is not permanent. As long as it's an honest failure and you don't start by blaming others and whatever, and you could start the conversation by saying, boy, did I learn a lot. Now, in this case, my investors learned a lot as well. Don't invest in video or, you know, whatever. And I was able to articulate something interesting I was going to do again in a completely different space, something I actually knew a lot more about. You know, it turned out to be quite profitable for everyone. But the point is, in an innovation cluster, um, founders get multiple shots at the goal, meaning they get to do it again. If failure is not considered... Um, permanent. It's considered learning and discovery. Now, if you fail three or four times in a row, I'm, I, I'm sure you're not no longer on the front of the list of, of right. many VCs, but you know, a single massive failure is not the end of the game. Right. And I, I, and I think the, the critical word there is learning, learning and discovery is what you were saying. So learning and discovery is in fact, you know, people say you fail fast and it's good to fail. No, failure feels miserable. Of course. No one wants to fail. No one wants to fail. But in fact, if you if you don't take those shots at the goal, right? Imagine a soccer game, football game, without taking multiple shots, you would never score. And that is the nature of of this is that distinction of, uh, between innovation and execution, right? We're experimenting and taking risks, um, and this was just a set of risks, which again, as I said, were compounded by hubris that didn't work out. But it didn't mean that. I was an unfundable, and, 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 and by the way, that is what makes founders, once you understand that, almost in, invulnerable doing a startup, in a, as I said, in an innovation cl cluster, meaning where there are investors who understand this nature of risk and reward, you bet on the founder's ability to kind of learn quickly and, and recover from, um, you know, from changes in, in, in opportunity. So there's that psychological side to it, though. It affects some people probably more than others. So uh, so do, is there a percentage, do we know this, is there a percentage of founders who kind of give up? Yeah, you know, I, I was surprised because it never crossed my mind <laughs> that, that's the, that you would give up. But yes, I found that in students and some friends I've known that go, no, I just ought to work for a big company. Now, there's nothing, not only isn't there anything wrong with that, it in fact says... That's probably where they belong, because as I said, crazy people do startups. Normal people actually have regular jobs. I mean, if you think about the percentage of people in the world who actually do what we do, that's a pretty small number. And rightly so. As I said, it requires, as we started in the beginning, a skill set that's different from feeling comfortable in execution. You have to feel comfortable in chaos and uncertainty, and yet at the same time, holding profound beliefs loosely held. That's hard to keep in your head. Looking at the medical healthcare field and the pace of... What of, a great time. <laughs> what a great oh time. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. total. Right. It, th this is the time of so many things happening. In every market. If we, were th if we thought CRISPR was the breakthrough, AI and all these other things we're doing, uh, in every part of the field, in healthcare, life sciences, you know... Even the FDA is being innovative. So all the moving parts, you know, even reimbursement is being forced to change and, and new players coming in trying to break the systems and, and distribution and others. What a great opportunity. There's like in every possible space. Um, and I think the outcomes for patients will be much better. If we learned to actually also engage patients, so I was going to actually ask you first about that, and then I'm going to come back to the whole what's happening with the industry. But where does the patient, you know, we started with the crema and, and, and the hip, but, but 
for, for the, the bigger question, our industry for a long, long time now has had patient centricity officers, and we talk about patient centricity, but patients still kind of struggle getting their voice sometimes hurt in, in this, and they're not necessarily part of the innovation process. Do you have any advice how companies should get closer to the patients? Well, you know, one is as part of this discovery process, you, you, the patients are somebody you need to chat with. As part of capitalism, patients may or may not be part of the equation, right? I mean, that's just an unfortunate part of the conversation. It might be that you're optimizing the reimbursement folks. Or, well, there's or, the patients and payers and providers triangle, right? right? That right. we all have to... And it might be the patients don't even count. Though, though, again, I'll play back to, as I remind my students, gee, is there an unfair competitive advantage if you actually do focus on, on creating something where patients have a voice? So... So it is possible to include patients, but I just want to be a little cynical. That says our current system does not put patients at the top of the pyramid, at least in my mind, but I might be wrong. So going then back to this whole innovation thing, I mean, I think um, because so much is happening all at once, I, I do think we're going to change the change the face of, of healthcare uh, very rapidly. Innovation has changed itself as well. It's no longer happening inside four walls, even for the biggest companies yeah. that have been there for a very long time. In fact, yeah. it's, it's, it's very different from that. And many of them are actually real struggling with their own business models, trying to figure out how to change that. What's your prediction from, uh, from an innovation side of the equation? What will define innovation in healthcare? Is it more really the, the startups coming together with the larger companies? How is the industry morphing as a result of everything that's going on? What Do, do you have predictions for us? Well, if I knew that, I'd, I'd be a hedge fund. Um, so <laughs> the, the, the answer is no, I don't. And to, uh, other than there are multiple moving pieces, and uh, this is when it was exciting for me as an entrepreneur, but as an investor and as an interest, industry observer, it's uh, all of it's changing, right? The role of uh, corporate, corporate venture capitalists, the way that corporates deal with startups and accelerators and, and regulation. It also in the United States uh, depends on, uh, you know, which administration we have uh, starting yeah. in next January. Uh, is it going to be industry friendly? Is it going to be, you know, uh, the current head of the FTC has an opinion about uh, regulation and, and which might be great for the consumer, but maybe not so great for some things that we might want to try on, on, on innovation. I think there's that natural tendency to, uh, to, and, and so we, so the answer is I, I'll, I'll have to pass on the question. Yes. So the U S is still on top of the charts, I think for startups way above way the above. rest of the world. Right. Is that shifting? It's very interesting. You know, EU uh, optimizes uh, AU regu uh, AI regulation and generates very little AI. The U.S. generates a lot of AI and has very little AI regulation. You know, to me, I think that's a that's a proxy for this kind of you know yin yang of which one would you prefer? Would you prefer yeah. a regulated world that keeps you ultimately safe um, potentially, but generates no innovation or very little? Or would you prefer the Wild West of innovation that puts privacy or other things at risk, which we're doing in the U.S.? And then China has another model, um, which is the state makes those decisions for you, whether you know you don't even get to participate in the conversation. Um, and, and innovation kind of happens there. But, uh, but again, it, China's innovation model was essentially destroyed in the last couple of years. So we kind of have this these three experiments being run about how we create innovative products, um, I think time will tell what's what's going to happen. Regulations are being harmonized across the globe quite a bit as well. I don't think so. With, no? Well, certainly I'd not say, in AI, and certainly not uh, AI applied to not healthcare. Not in AI yet. And not in AI applied to healthcare yet either. That's true, but although I think that that's, that's that place where everybody's looking to see what happens with the regulation side of that right now, because it, it is rather new. And AI, is, it's, a, it's a really fascinating place for me because AI has been around for a while, but suddenly right now we can't talk about anything but AI lately. What do you think is the promise of AI? Well, I think it's exactly like asking the question of what's the promise of the internet in 1996 when Netscape went public. I, I don't think could have imagined, 
you know, the ecosystem that uh, developed within our, our lifetime, within a, less than a generation, a quarter century. I think it's going to be as transformative as the invention of the computer or, or you know, the invention of the net. And that's probably the best I could say. I'm, others might have some very specific uh, predictions. But for me, the eye-opener was on the very technical level. Um, I first started paying attention to AI in healthcare uh, when I saw AlphaFold. And that was just the, you know, we're, we're talking about only 24 months ago, right? And we're now, you know, we're not only folding, you know, we're folding entire membranes and, you know, large molecules. And, you know, if this was if this was pre-AI, that would have won the Nobel Prize, right? You could you saw the protein folding problem was the holy grail for you know for decades, right? We were sending crystals up to the space station to get better models. Um, yeah. Um, and, and what I just want to point out is that was 24 months ago. That was like Watson and Crick in '53, and by '55 we we had figured it all out. Um, you know, we're just really at the tip of the iceberg and 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 that delta rate of change of what's coming out just in that area is just mind-blowing yeah and it's the rate of change actually that now brings me back to these legacy companies and we talked a little bit about where this you know who's who's defining success for uh, uh in, in life sciences for any company these days it feels as though we have to change the business models we have to learn to partner differently because there is no way to keep up with this pace of change. Otherwise, there's no way. You know, in the software uh, world, there's kind of two models right now for AI. Investing tens of billions of dollars like Microsoft and Google um, yeah. into AI platforms that are actually driving it, right? Microsoft and OpenAI, and then Microsoft created products like Copilot and the rest, which have so far this year, half a billion dollar business. Or you could be an acquisition engine, meaning you could turn your firm into something that is just uh, acquiring at a rapid speed and figuring out how to competently, competently integrate, which most companies fail at. I mean, they might be good at M&A, but they fail at the cultural part of integration. I think those are going to be the two models um, for healthcare and life sciences. And, and I think we're starting to see the inklings in both. I, I, and I guess the point I'm trying to make is that the modeling what the software companies are do, doing to keep up with this arms race is, is probably the best proxy for what if I was a large farmer or someone else to, to start thinking about, is either uh, be spending tens of billions in investing in these things or tens of billions of acquiring smaller things that you could build a portfolio of useful applications. And then if you do the latter, that means also different sets and different capabilities inside, because to your point, the failure comes in integration or even even if you're not acquiring, if you're just building alliances, a lot of companies are not all that great in, in managing strategic alliances either. And you know what ha what happens typically in those uh, in those acquisitions is that you have a C-suite or a CEO with a vision, and you have the world's worst uh, implementation. That is, the vision doesn't match the because the CEO loses sight of what really matters is like, well, wait a minute, do they get to keep their own health plan or HR policies or whatever? Some of the real tactical things that actually you're acquiring, not only the IP, you're acquiring the talent. You know, I didn't sign up to join your large company, so now you've got to convince me to want to stay. And in fact, what, what happens is worse is we leave it to the bureaucrats of the large company to actually try to keep the culture of the startup. And that's, an, as I said, an impedance mismatch. Of Typically does, does not go well. And, and so then that goes back to then to that person who is the startup we use that, okay, you need to really kind of understand which way you want to go for your own, for your own destiny in this process. So we've talked about a lot of different things. Um, and I kind of towards the end here want to make sure we maybe crystallize the few key sort of nuggets of wisdom or takeaways that you would give for that founder, that innovator of a startup, if they are just now taking their first steps. Sure. I guess the, the first one is, uh, you know, there are no facts inside the building or your lab, so get the heck outside. Probably number two is, uh, you know, as smart as you are, and you probably are the smartest person in your room or building. Uh, you can't be smarter than the collective intelligence of your potential customers or regulators or partners. I mean, you simply can't pre-compute that, even though you think you are. And then probably third is, uh, you know, while you believe you can see the future, 
I'll contend that all you have is a series of untested hypotheses. So why don't you just humor me and your investors and go validate them and you'll be surprised about how many of them were actually, you know, maybe not correct. It doesn't mean you give up. It just means you actually go pivot um, and, and do something else. So that's what I, what I would start with. And then just understand there's already a, a proven, not the proven, but a proven methodology to do this rapidly. Um, and, uh, and there's frameworks and tools that, that allow uh, inventors and technologists and pr principal investigators to not have to become the business person, but to understand the key components. Um, so they're no longer kind of along for the ride, but they actually get to steer the ship. So that would be my advice. Very good. And Steve, I see that you have an extensive uh, uh, website, I think, and, and you're blogging on a, on a regular basis on different topics that are linked to some of the things that we've discussed today. Um, what can people find by by coming to your website? And would you just share the uh, share the address so everybody can find you? Pretty easy. The website is my name, steveblank.com. And, and for those of you in life sciences, there's categories on the left which talk about uh, NIH, some NSF things, talk about these classes. There's, there's some real real world examples under the NIH thing about what each what the teams learned in each week of this process and what this innovation process looks like for those of you who are pis you could go to either the nih and or the nsf websites and look for i core i dash c o r p s um these are sbir programs that yep they said now in its second decade and i think you'll find a lot of uh, interesting information and can we engage with you directly in your website and, and give comments to your blogs or, yep. all right, one last question. And I know that, um, you know, we could probably continue with, with a number of different things here, but just on a personal level, you, you have started businesses. You are, you are, I'm thinking that there is this mindset inside of your own self that has kind of likes that, that a little bit of that uncertainty that and curiosity that comes with newness. What's in in your future? What's what's your what's your next thing that you are looking at? Waking up uh, tomorrow, um, you know. So every day is a new adventure. Um, you know, I, my interests take me wherever it comes up. You know, I still read a variety of things. Every still read science and nature, and I still read you know um, other areas and physics and and. Uh, and software and things are just interesting out there. The world's an interesting place. Um, we're only scratching the surface of, as we know, what's possible. Always surprised about what's around the corner. And continuing to learn and discover, sounds like. Thank you so much, Steve. I appreciate the time today and uh, good luck with, um, with whatever that next discovery is of yours. Well, thanks for having me. This was fun. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Check out leadersagenda.com for information on our past and future episodes. And I do hope that you engage with us also on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook, and post your comments about what you heard today and your ideas forward. Keep us. Thank you.